Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our 41st Blue Heads Virtual Seminar. Blue Heads Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows healthcare professionals to discuss current management updates of different health related topics for better patient care. This, this platform is brought to you by Blue Heads Ethiopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. And we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine. And I'm your host, Dr. Rino Tadela, a general physician and first aid trainer from Blue Heads Ethiopia. It's a pleasure to have Dr. Abraham Gennatu here with us today to give us a presentation on the approach to chest injury. To give you a background on Dr. Abraham Gennatu, he is a general surgeon and fellow of College of Eastern Central in Southern Africa. He did his Doctor of Medicine degree at Addis Ababa University and completed his specialty in general surgery at Addis Ababa University. Dr. Abraham is, is currently doing his cardiothoracic surgery fellowship at Addis Ababa University. Dr. Abraham is an assistant professor of surgery, cardiothoracic and vascular surgery division, Department of Surgery at Addis Ababa University. He published 16 papers. His focus areas were access to surgery and cardiac surgery, to patient safety and uh, surgical service efficiency. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Today we will be discussing about uh, chest injury and how we should manage this patient in uh, probably 45 minutes, maximum one hour. So the topic is very vast uh, and uh, might be difficult to cover everything in a single session. Therefore, I'll try to uh, give you like a brief content on the most important aspects and especially on those chest injuries which should be managed by uh, general practitioners or uh, surgical residents and sometimes even uh, clinical to C1 students or other health professionals like health officers. Okay, so uh, our today's objectives are three. So the first objective is for you to have a working knowledge on general approach to patients who have sustained chest injury. The other objective would be to identify and treat immediately life-threatening conditions that arise from a chest injury, mainly while you are doing the primary survey. And the last one would be for you to be able to identify and treat or refer potentially life-threatening conditions while you do, uh, after you do second, your secondary survey during your uh, home assessment. So these will be our objectives. Uh, why should we discuss about chest injury? We have plenty of reasons why, why we should generally uh, discuss about trauma, why we should, all of us uh, should be well aware on how to manage patients with trauma. Uh, one very important thing is, so generally in medicine, everybody should know the most common things and those who are in a specific specialty should know a very rare things. So since injury or trauma is a very common thing, everybody should know how to handle uh, patients who have sustained this, uh, this trauma. And injury is the commonest cause of death in the population age zero to 44. has become the most common cause of death. And among all patients who died from, who died from uh, trauma, the most common cause of death comes from traumatic brain injury and it is followed by chest injury. So chest injury accounts for about 25% of all trauma-related deaths. It's a quarter of all trauma-related deaths. And the good thing is uh, for a patient who has sustained traumatic brain injury, you might need a neurosurgeon 
for a patient who has sustained abdominal injury, you might need a general surgeon. For a patient who has sustained an orthopedic injury, you might need an orthopedic surgeon. But for most patients who have sustained chest injury, even a C1 student with the proper knowledge and proper exposure can manage up to 85% of, percent of these patients. So it's very relevant for you to understand, to diagnose the condition, and to be able to treat it. Um, so generally, this chest injury can happen from either penetrating injury or blunt injury. And uh, only about 10% of those with blunt injury will require surgical intervention. And probably around 20% of those sustained penetrating injury will require surgical intervention, meaning like thoracotomy and the like. Otherwise, most of them, like 85%, are managed. The highest procedure the, that you do will be to, to do a chest tube insertion. So it's very relevant for all of us to understand this uh, condition. Now, uh, just as a brief introduction, we should understand the brief, briefly the concept of trauma. So basically, what is trauma? Trauma or injury, I will use the words interchangeably. Um, so injury happens when there is an energy transfer. But that energy transfer must exceed the tensile capacity of the tissues or at the, at the, at the cellular level so that the uh, amount of energy that's applied to our body uh, will result in tearing apart of uh, the uh, uh, the, the tissue, the organs, or at cellular levels, which means the amount of injury is directly related or proportional to the amount of energy transferred. Uh, but not only that, since our body is made up of very different type of uh, organs, which are because of different cellular arrangements, the tensile capacity of our the uh, organs is also different. So the tensile capacity of a bone, for example, is different than that of liver, obviously. So some organs can handle higher energy transfer, while other organs cannot handle even a small energy transfer. Now, why do we have to know this? <clears throat> we have to know this because uh, when we are taking, especially the history parts, we have to understand the level of energy transfer. We have to ask patients that so that we can understand the, 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 the amount of energy transfer. Now, so basically from our high school physics, we know there are two kinds of uh, energy that can be involved in trauma. And these are the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So I believe you all know the kinetic energy, the formula, which is half mv square which means kinetic energy is equal to half mass times velocity squared. Therefore, if, for example, uh, a man is hit by a car, and if the car's weight or mass is higher, the amount of energy transfer will be higher. So that's why a CNO track will cause a higher, inner, higher trauma, higher uh, level of trauma than, let's say, a bajaj. Uh, with the same token, the velocity of that object that causes the trauma is also very important since the formula says half mv squared. So what does that mean? Uh, let's say a minibus, a minibus that is traveling at 80 kilometers per hour will can can potentially cause a higher trauma or higher energy transfer than a CNO track that was going at 10 kilometers per hour. So when you ask the history, you should ask um, how was the patient hit? Like how was the speed of the car? What was the kind of collision uh, and the like? And the other is for patients who sustain injury from fall down, this is a kind of a potential energy that later is converted to a kinetic energy. Therefore, 
the formula as you know is potential energy is equal to mass times gravity times height. So you should ask at what height the patient fell from, or at from which floor, or possibly put it or at from, from uh, how many meters of estimated height the patient fell from because of the amount of energy in the total mass. Now, uh, after that, we have to know that the major killers in trauma generally and in chest trauma in particular are this uh, hypoxia, hypovolemia, and tamponade. The good thing is we can identify and manage all of these without any sophisticated equipment and without any sophisticated knowledge or surgical skill as well. Okay, so uh, there are generally about 12 different kinds of uh, chest injury. Of course, there might be some minor injuries like skin laceration on the chest and the like, but we are not going to discuss about that. We are going to discuss about the 12 major chest injuries uh, briefly. These 12 major chest injuries are called the deadly dose. And they are classified as immediately life threatening and potentially life threatening conditions. So, the immediately life threatening conditions, as the name indicates, the patient is at risk of death from these injuries immediately. Therefore, during our primary survey, we have to be able to identify these. Uh, these life threatening conditions, immediately life threatening conditions, and start management. Potentially life threatening conditions, they can give you uh, some time. So you usually identify them in your secondary survey or while you are doing follow up after you admit patients in the ward and the like. They are still life threatening, but you, you, you at least have some time to identify, to manage, or to collect your human uh, resources to manage these patients. So uh, we will discuss briefly about a couple of these ones. And at the end, we will discuss about how to generally approach a patient who come with uh, just trauma. All right. So the first one is airway obstruction. Airway obstruction in a trauma patient is always the priority. Is number one priority is the airway. It's because if the airway is completely obstructed, you only have four to five minutes before permanent brain disease issues. So four to five minutes is really, really small time. Fortunately, uh, most patients will not have a complete airway obstruction. So they might give you a little more than that four or five minutes. But still, it is the first priority in a trauma patient. Uh, because other breathing problems, they can give you 30 minutes or more. Circulation problems, they can give you uh, even longer hours. So airway is always the first priority. And what can cause airway obstruction in, in a trauma patient? So uh, one is tongue fallback. This happens when patient is unconscious, usually GCS is less than uh, eight, and the patient does not have the reflex and the like. So if the tongue falls back, it goes and completely uh, obstructs the, the airway. Therefore, we have to identify if the, if the patient can maintain his or her airway during our primary survey and act immediately. Others like adult disease, diabetes, uh, bleeding, secretions, dentures, hematoma, especially in patients with neck injury, and airway edema are the common cause. So, Patients obviously will have clear manifestations. They will be in, in air hunger. They will be anxious. If they are speaking, you could he hear some hoarse little voice. During the breathing, there might be some strider, wheezes, and the like. Uh, if the airway obstruction is not managed immediately, the brain is not getting enough oxygen, so they will have kind of altered mental, mental status. And finally, patients will go into apnea and uh, there will be a cardiac arrest if we don't do anything. Um, cyanosis it can also be there. It might be difficult in a trauma setting to, to detect cyanosis, especially in uh, dark tone <coughs> colored population like, uh, like Ethiopian population. 
So we should not wait until this this cyanosis in apnea happens. We should manage immediately. And how do we manage this airway problem? So airway problems can be managed with tentative temporary solutions or permanent or definitive uh, solutions. Now, it depends on uh, where you are, what kind of gadgets you are in the lab. Uh, for example, until somebody brings airway, you can apply jaw thrust or chin lift. If there is a strong suspicion that uh, there might be cervical injury, or if you cannot close cervical injury, it's not advisable to do chin lift, rather you should do jaw thrust, as you see on this picture here, so that you avoid uh, complicating any uh, possible spinal cord injury that, that might already be there. So you, when you apply these maneuvers, you are opening the airway, and there will be air going into the lungs. So that will be a temporary solution. Uh, in instruments, if you have nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal airway, you, you should immediately apply them in patients who are having this problem. And definitive airway or invasive airway management should be provided for patients with obstruction, with apnea, hypoxia, and expanding neck hematomas. So what are these? You can do endotracheal intubation, or uh, you can do tracheostomy. And until you do this tracheostomy or endotracheal intubation, you can also use what's called tricothyroidotomy. Uh, which is basically inserting uh, a wide bore needle in 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 the, in the tricothyroid membrane. So that is uh, about airway obstruction. Coming to uh, our next problem in, in patients who sustain chest injury, which is another common problem. I don't know if you can properly see this chest X-ray. Uh, is it visible? I hope it's visible. It's visible, Doc. Yeah. What do you see? I, I would like to hear what uh, what what you guys see. If you see any finding from this chest X-ray, you can just type on the chat box or on the Q and A session. I mean, uh, part. Okay. Tension pneumothorax, right side pneumothorax, suggestive of pneumothorax, Dr. Emanuel. Yes. Yeah, you are right. All of you are right. So there is right sided pneumothorax for this patient. There might be left side pulmonary condition on this side, but the picture is not really clear. And there is a large, massive pneumothorax. There might be some. Uh, mediastinal shift to the left side as well. So this is one very common problem. And how, why does, or how does pneumothorax happen? What kind of pneumothorax are there in patients with trauma? So generally there are other causes of trauma, which are called the uh, primary and secondary pneumothorax. But today we'll be discussing about traumatic pneumothorax. And in traumatic pneumothorax, you can have these three forms. One is closed pneumothorax, the other is open pneumothorax, and the last one will be tension pneumothorax. Now, the pleural cavity normally is uh, a negative pressure space because it has to pull the lung outward so that there is gas coming into, uh, into the alveoli. So normally it should be negative. It is negative 5 to negative 7.5. Uh, centimeter water that is its pressure so uh, in closed pneumothorax there might be some injury to the pulmonary parenchyma for example that could happen when there is a rib fracture and that rib fracture punctures the lungs so there will be a little bit of air coming into the pleural cavity but the pleural cavity pressure is still less than the atmospheric pressure. So what does that mean? 
this cannot completely uh, collapse the lung, but it will have some effect and the pressure can progressively build up so that uh, the lung become progressively collapsed. In open pneumothorax, obviously there is an opening and there is a communication, but this communication is large enough to equilibrate the pressure between the atmosphere and the pleural space. So the pleural space pressure, uh, the, negativ the negativity of the pleural space pre uh, pressure will be lost. In that case, the patient's lung cannot expand. So that is how open pneumothorax happens. Intention pneumothorax, so in open pneumothorax, air will be going in, it is going out as well. But in tension pneumothorax, it is kind of working as a one-way valve. So air is going into the pleural cavity, but there is no way to go out. There is no way to go out. Therefore, progressively, there will be increased accumulation of air in the pleural cavity with every breath. With every breath the patient takes, there is an incoming air from the outside into the pleural cavity. Or it can also come from inside, like injury to the trachea and bronchus and the like. And in, in this condition, the pleural cavity pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure. Therefore, forget the lung expansion. The lung will be collapsed and it will even push the right side structures, mediastinal structures to the contralateral side. So these are the three different uh, kind of pneumothorax. And the management also uh, follows these basic pathophysiologic principles. So the first one, tension pneumothorax, it can be caused by penetrating chest trauma. It can be caused by blunt chest trauma when there is parenchymal lung injury. Uh, patients who are on, on mechanical ventilation can also sustain what's called barrel trauma and that could result in positive, from positive pressure ventilation, they might develop tension pneumothorax while they are intubated. Or due to atrogenic lung injury, during bronchoscopy and the like, we can have this tension pneumothorax. So during tension pneumothorax, what will happen? The, the inferior vena cava is compressed. The superior vena cava will be compressed. Therefore, the venous return will be decreased. If there is no venous return, there will be decreased cardiac output, so the patient will be in shock. If the superior vena cava is compressed, since the jugular veins go into drain uh, ultimately into the superior vena cava, there will be jugular venous distension. And to compensate for this, for this hypovolemia, for this shock, the patient will be tachycardic, the patient will be sweating and the like. And because of this pressure build up, as I said, the mediastinal structures and the lung will be shifting to the contralateral side. So the shock that happens from the new tension pneumothorax, we call it obstructing shock, because it's not, I mean, uh, it's, 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 the shock happens not because of volume loss or from bleeding and the like, but rather because the blood is not coming back to the heart. So, that is a basic part of physiology. And the treatment for tension pneumothorax is quite simple. It's quite simple. The first thing is you have to, uh, trauma, it is a team management. So somebody should give the patient oxygen supplementation. Somebody should uh, try oxygen, I mean, a large bowl cannula uh, at the second intercostal space along the midclavicular line to decompress the, the chest. And if there is an opening that's causing this kind of pneumothorax, you can do what's called finger decompression. You kind of give it a space. So when you give it a space, that one-way valve will be lost. So air will kind of gush out of the thoracic cavity and the patient will have a sigh of uh, kind of relief. But this is not the definitive management. These are the things that you do while you are preparing to do tube thoracostomy or chest tube insertion. So the definitive management with the chest tube insertion and managing if there are any other uh, intrathoracic problems like uh, tracheal or bronchial injury that have resulted in, in leak. 
Okay, so the other one, open new motorworks. As I said, it is because of large defects, it's usually three centimeters or more. Uh, open new motorworks, it results in impaired ventilation because as I, as I have said earlier, the lung cannot properly extract. When there is impaired ventilation, there will be hypoxia. The carbon dioxide cannot be exhaled, there will be hypercarbia. So the, the management, I mean, the clinical presentation is with uh, respiratory distress features. And for these patients, you can do chest X-ray for patient with tension pneumothorax. It is a clinical diagnosis. You should evaluate the patient in diagnosis without assistance of chest X-ray. You should never send a patient to do chest X-ray. But for these patients, you usually have some time. You put them on oxygen and you do chest X-ray and you see uh, you see uh, the uh, pneumothorax. Uh, so <clears throat> one way to to manage this open pneumothorax will be to apply this kind of dressing. This is called the three-way dressing. We apply this because uh, there is one opening on one side, but the other sides are taped with a plaster. So when the patient is inspiring, this part will not allow air to go into the chest. But when the chest is exhaling, air will come out of the chest. Therefore, with each breeze, the amount of air in the pleural cavity will be decreasing. So that is one way to manage open pneumothorax. Uh, but ultimately, these patients will need tube thoracostomy. For all patients with this kind of problem, you should do chest tube insertion. But meanwhile, you can do the three-way dressing until you prepare and apply the, the, the chest tube. <laughs> okay, so what have we seen so far? We have seen the three immediately life-threatening problems. Airway obstruction, tension pneumothorax, and open pneumothorax. Uh, we will have three more um, immediately life-threatening problems. So if this patient had sustained a chest trauma, this is basically what we call a hemothorax. <clears throat> now, uh, sometimes patients will have both air and blood that's called hemonymothorax. Sometimes patients just have air only, sometimes patients have blood only. So in this case, for example, you know that there is no pneumothorax because if there was a pneumothorax, you should have seen a straight line here. That's that's what's called air flu level. So hemothorax is another major problem in patients who sustain chest injury. And the one that is immediately life threatening is called massive hemothorax. And uh, everybody should understand, should remember the definition of this massive hemothorax because it is one of the few things that require urgent referral to a center where there is a cardiothoracic surgeon or at least at least a general surgeon with the capacity to do a thoracotomy. Uh, there are different definitions for massive hemothorax. One definition is rapid accumulation of more than 1.5 liters of blood. One definition is when the, the, the you insert chest tube and when you follow or on immediate insertion, you have more than 1.5 liters of blood coming out. The other definition is especially for a pediatric population or for people who are, uh, who are whose weight is probably like less than 50 kg, you can use a formula of 3 ml per kg per hour of blood coming out through the chest tube for two to three hours after chest tube insertion. So if you see the patient is uh, bleeding two, I mean three milliliter per kg per hour for two to three hours, that also qualifies for massive hemothorax. Uh, or basically it would mean one third of the patient's blood is lost through a hemothorax. So 
these are the different definitions. Now, uh, it can happen from both blend and penetrating injury. Usually people think that it happens only from penetrating injury, but it can also happen from a blend injury. And uh, the two most common arteries that result in this are the intercostal and the internal mammary vessels. Uh, usually if there is a bleeding from the lung to parenchyma, uh, it will stop on its own, especially when you insert chest tube, the lung will expand and that will stop the bleeding. It is not from the mechanical compression from the expansion, but uh, rather the surface area of the lung will be larger when it expands. So the, um, the, the, the bleeding that was there from the lung parenchyma will stop. So the two main problems that result in massive hypothorax are intercostal and uh, internal mammary arteries. Clinical uh, presentation, obviously this is a patient who had chest injury and now they have respiratory distress, a sign of fluid collection on one side of the chest, their percussion note, they might, they might go into shock as well. How do you manage them? You have to immediately uh, resuscitate these patients. You have to immediately put the chest tube, and you should prepare uh, blood. You should cross match blood. You should refer these patients to a center where there is a cardiothoracic surgeon, and uh, usually they are managed with a thoracotomy. Sometimes we just close them for a couple of hours by resuscitating them, and the bleeding will stop. But that does not mean that the patient should, should not be transferred immediately. The patient should be transferred immediately. Uh, so, yeah, that is that's how we manage uh, massive uh, hemothorax. So during thoracotomy, we can identify the bleeding vessels and they can be ligated. Here is uh, another image. This is a chest X-ray of, let's say, a patient who had a stab injury to the fifth intercostal space on the left side anteriorly. Now you can see uh, the, the pericardium and the heart shadow is enlarged, right? So this is uh, a pericardial collection. And pericardial component is another killer, one of the three killers in patients with chest injury. So uh, what is tamponade? Tamponade is the physiological effect when there is a large amount of fluid that's collected in the pericardium. So normally we have a little amount of uh, serous fluid in the pericardium, but in acute conditions, uh, when there is around 200 to 250 ml of blood, accumulating in the pericardium, it will compress the heart and the heart cannot properly beat. So that will result in, in the physiologic condition called tamponade. So these patients will have failure to, to have adequate preload, meaning the venous return will be compromised. Therefore, just like patients with tension pneumothorax, they can go into a uh, uh, kind of obstructive shock. And <clears throat> uh, because of that, it, is, it might be uh, difficult to differentiate this patient's condition from tension pneumothorax. But if you do uh, fast or focused uh, assessment with sonography for trauma, you will identify this collection properly. It's very easy to identify. And on the chest X-ray as well, you can see the enlargement of the, the heart shadow. Uh, there is a what's called a clinical triad of x -triad. But in a trauma setting, in the emergency where it's hectic and the like, uh, it might be difficult to properly appreciate these findings. Uh, and also, you might not find all of them at the same time in, in, in an excluded area. 
the presence of uh, pericardial tamponade. How do we manage these patients? Obviously, they are managed with the ATLS protocol, like uh, administering of food, support with oxygen, and the like. Uh, and these patients will require surgical management. Surgical management with thoracotomy or sternotomy and to repair the cause of the bleeding. Usually it is the right ventricle or the left ventricle that is perforated and they can be repaired. But meanwhile, for example, if this patient is in a rural setup and the like, what you can do is you can do needle pericardiosynthesis. It is a kind of temporizing measure until you can transfer this patient to another setup. You can do needle pericardiosynthesis. And it's not difficult. You can do it by just understanding the anatomy. So you apply, the, you insert the uh, syringe at 45 degree angle just below the xiphoid process, and you should direct it towards the left shoulder. So if you do that, you will definitely go into the pericardium. So while you are going in, try to aspirate, and when blood comes out, means you are in the pericardium. So this is a temporizing measure, and ultimately the patient will be transferred to the center where thoracotomy can be done. <clears throat> the last one will be tracheobronchial injuries from the immediately life-threatening conditions. Uh, and the tracheobronchial injuries are usually very rare, and you might identify them when patients develop especially subclinic emphysema, because others are usually not clearly uh, suggestive of the specific diagnosis of tracheobronchial injuries. And if bronchoscopy is available and if it is done, it is a gold standard to confirm this pathology. Management, usually you insert chest tube and then the, the site of injury can heal by itself. But if the patient is in distress, the patient should be intubated and the repair should be done in centers where endoscopic repair is available, it can be done with endoscopy or with uh, surgical repair, with surgical repair. So usually the surgical repair is indicated for patients who continue to have air leak or bubbling from the chest tube uh, for uh, at least more than 48 hours after you have inserted the chest tube. <clears throat> and if you do chest CV scan, you can clearly identify the site of the injury, can measure the circumference of the injury. And in that case, if it is more than one third of the circumference of the trachea or the bronchus, that's also another indication for surgical intervention. Okay. Uh, now we have discussed about the immediate life treatment conditions. We will briefly talk about the other common pathologies. This is another x-ray of a patient we had in Manelik Hospital. So this is another common problem. You may probably see here rib fractures or starting from the second rib, from the third rib, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. This patient had multiple rib fractures on the right side. There is also a rib fracture on this side. And rib fracture is one very common problem. In fact, this is the most common thoracic injury. And if the rib fracture is on the first rib and on the second rib, it usually indicates that the mechanism of injury is a high energy injury because these ribs usually do not get fractured easily, uh, but the rest are, can easily be broken. Is, uh, even trivial injuries and uh, the most common rib fractures are also those ribs that can be fractured easily. The good thing is uh, rib fractures can be managed with just analgesics and oxygen support. So the main part of physiology that happens in patients with rib fracture is 
The repass periosteum, the periosteum is somatically innervated, so there will be pain. And uh, because of the pain, patients cannot breathe properly. If they cannot breathe, they can develop uh, hypoxia, atelectasis, pneumonia, and the like. The management otherwise is so to manage this pain so that patients can breathe properly. If patients can breathe properly, the rib fracture usually heals by itself without any surgical intervention. Okay, let me show you uh, one, uh, one patient we had again a couple of months back. I don't know if you can see this short video of this patient. This is Savio uh, Takamatuano, so it's his legs. And uh, this is a posterior chest on the right side. And he had road traffic accident. He was hit on the right side of the chest around here. I mean, uh, he was hit by an ox. Uh, around here, you can see the marks and the like. And this is what a flail chest looks like, okay? This is what a flail chest uh, looks like. This patient had, so flail chest happens when there is three or more rib fracture sites at uh, at least two sites. And uh, uh, flail chest happens, I mean, the, the main problem in patients with flail chest is uh, problem with ventilation. It is called a paradoxical chest wall motion. As you can see on this video, when the patient is trying to inhale, the flail segment goes into, into the lung. So at the time when we need the lung to expand, this flail segment is causing compression on the lung. So it causes ventilation problem. So that is the main part of physiology. So to manage these patients, it is basically um, supporting with oxygen. And if patients are in severe respiratory distress, meaning like respiratory rate greater than 40, uh, saturation less than 60%, even on face mask, you have to intubate these patients. Because the injuries, uh, the rib fracture is severe, they also have uh, contusion pulmonary confusion, so that more may also cause respiratory depression. Most of them are managed non-operatively. Flail chest by itself is not an indication for surgical intervention. Rather, the management is analgesia and oxygen support. Uh, we manage <laughs> flail chest with surgery if patients have persistent pain or if you put them on mechanical ventilation and if they cannot be weaned from the mechanical ventilation, or if progressively the pulmonary function is declining. Otherwise, in patients with rib fracture, some rib fractures are managed with surgery and these are some of the indications, like painful clicking mobile ribs, or if the rib is impaled into an organ and the like. So if patients don't have these indications, you manage them supportively with analgesics. The last one I would like to discuss is pulmonary contusion. Uh, <clears throat> pulmonary contusion is basically when there is a capillary tear because of a severe injury. And as you can see on this, X-rays, usually this pulmonary contusion is not clearly evident during admission. For example, if you see this, the left side of the chest, at 12 hours, it is more clearly visible. But during admission, during initial presentation, on X-ray, you might not find even anything. But patients generally have a high energy trauma mechanism. Uh, in pulmonary contusion, the alveoli are filled with blood. Therefore, the ventilation perfusion cannot happen in those alveoli. 
So patients develop respiratory distress. And to develop this respiratory distress, they might take at least 12 hours. And it gets peak around 48 to 72 hours. After that, usually pulmonary contagion uh, resolves by itself. So our role as a physician is to help patients with their oxygenation during this critical period of time, in the first three to four days. What do you do? You give them oxygen, you give them analgesia. Don't give too much fluid, okay? And you should uh, either intubate them or refer them to a center where there is intubation. They uh, have severe respiratory distress. Other injuries are uh, rare. <clears throat> so blunt cardiac injury is a rare thing. Usually it manifests with uh, ECG abnormalities. It's rare, but it is also a kind of lethal problem. Esophageal injury is also another rare thing. Uh, diaphragmatic injury and esophageal injury. The main purpose of non-surgeon non physicians is to be able to identify them and to refer patients immediately to a center with a cardiothoracic surgeon. And aortic injuries usually result in immediate days at the scene, but if patients arrive to the hospital, it means the hemorrhage is contained and these patients can also be managed, but this is also generally rare. So I suggest you to have additional reading for the sake of our time on these ones. And uh, lastly, I will discuss about how to approach these patients so that we can properly identify these pathologies and manage our patients. <clears throat> so the approach, as you know, in trauma is obviously a TLS protocol, but there are some things that people, I see people forget or not do. I understand that we might not have proper team in our settings or the environment is not good and the like, but at least we should try to uh, we should try to put all of our endeavors uh, towards developing this kind of uh, setup in our hospitals where patients with trauma can be managed with the team. Uh, and whenever you are approaching the patient, you treat the greatest threat to life first, which is the airway, followed by the breathing, the circulation. These are the three most important problems. And <clears throat> following a TLS protocol allows you to manage and to save a life, even though you don't know the actual diagnosis. That's a very good part of it. If you just follow what it says, you will save the patient. You don't have to know what the patient has. And you don't need detailed history. The patient might even be unconscious and you don't need detailed history or physical examination and the like to start evaluate, to manage and to treat life threatening conditions. And always trauma patients must be managed with a team. Uh, and whenever you are identifying a problem in the airway, manage it immediately. Don't wait until you completely evaluate the patient. This is another very important concept. So <clears throat> in well uh, set uh, trauma systems, they have uh, a chain of services starting from pre-hospital care, preparation, triage, uh, then patients come to the hospital, primary survey is done, then adjuncts to primary survey are provided, then secondary survey is done, adjuncts to secondary survey are done, patients will definitely, I mean, ultimately have definitive care. So in our country, usually we don't have the pre-hospital part, it is kind of very limited. Uh, and the triage system is also not well developed because especially patient, people who are trained in the emergency medicine are still very small in number in our country. You might not find these proper triage systems in every hospital, but it is really, really important. So while you are doing the primary survey, 
you you do the ABCDs. Uh, if you need, yeah. Uh, and uh, by we all should understand what we mean by A, what we mean by, I mean, what do we do as part of the breathing and the like. So in the airway, ask the patient for their name. If they respond, usually you are good. They are good. Uh, if they are unconscious and the like, you have to at least apply this kind of uh, airway or pharyngeal airway. If they are uh, very, uh, I mean, low GCS, you should consider intubation. So by the A part of the primary survey, you at least can identify and treat the airway obstruction. Then you go to the breathing and ventilation. In this case as well, you just observe the chest, the chest, the diaphragm. I mean the, the the chest wall of the patient, and you see if there is good chest expression. Uh, you see the neck, if there is jugular venous distension, tracheal position is shifted, and the like. You can expect uh, tension in motorax. You auscultate, and then you might get absence of air entry. You when you do percussion, if it is dull, it means it is fluid. If it is not tell and if it is hyper resonant, you know it is a new motorax. So you act immediately for patients who have this kind of problems. You give them oxygen. If you suspect uh, air accumulation, you do little decompression. And by just doing the B part, you can identify tension new motorax, open new motorax, new motorax, tracheobronchial injuries. By palpating, you might find subcutaneous emphysema clear chest from just observation and rupture of diaphragm that resulted in um, breathing problem can also be identified from the just the breathing aspect. Uh, on the circulation aspect, so again, you, you examine the, the pulse or it's, uh, I mean, you check if the pulse is strong, uh, the pulse rate, examine the extremities so patient, if patients are in shock they will be having a sympathetic response and that will result in excessive sweating that sweating is what's called clammy clammy extremity so july love love in a patient clammy extremity and because there is no adequate blood flow to the extremities when patients are in low volume state their extremities will be very cold cold and clammy extremities. If there is external bleeding that you can identify, immediately you should apply compression. Uh, by doing chest X-ray and fast, you can identify if there is a pneumothorax, I mean chemothorax or pericardial fluid. So you check your IV lines, you draw blood, you send for cross match, and by doing the circulation part, you will identify these three main problems. Massive hemothorax, pericardial tamponad, and possibly aortic injuries. Uh, and then you examine the GCS of the patient. You completely expose the patient, I mean, undress, and then examine. After you finish the examining, make sure you cover the patient with blankets so that you prevent hypothermia. So after this, you might do some uh, tests like ECG monitoring, pulse oximeter. Uh, in, say, in better setups, carbon dioxide monitoring. But in most setups, at least there is some ultrasound. So fast and if fast and chest X-ray and other X-rays are very important and very helpful. So <clears throat> uh, by doing these adjuncts of the primary survey, you can identify myocardial contagion, for example. How? If you do ECG, you might identify uh, arrhythmias, and that tells you planned cardiac injury. You might identify pulmonary contusion. How? If you do chest X-ray, if you do arterial blood gas analysis, you will identify uh, pulmonary contusion. So basically, from even from the primary survey, you can identify almost all of the twelve deadly dozen in chest injury. But some some problems will require a secondary survey. Not, I mean, diagnosed of, for example, rupture of diaphragm, 
might even be difficult with secondary survey, even with a CT scan, okay? <clears throat> so in secondary surveys, almost something like you do in other patients, except when you are asking history, you ask for the ample history, I'm sure you know you have heard of it. Otherwise you do complete physical examination, you do tests, this time you might do CT scan, bronchoscopy, endoscopy, and these tests will give you a diagnosis for these problems. Bronchoscopy for this one, laparoscopy or thoracoscopy for diaphragmatic injuries, uh, barium test or CT scan for esophageal injuries and the like. So in that way, you can diagnose all these problems and you can manage uh, most of them. And most of them are managed with tube thoracostomy. Uh, life saving skills uh, you must acquire to manage patients in chest injury are quite common and simple. <clears throat> so all health professionals must be able to do chest tube insertion, tracheostomy, needle decompression, and cricothyroidotomy. So all health professionals must be must be able to do these procedures. Please, I, I urge you to challenge yourself if you are not able, if you frustrate to do any of these, please try to watch some videos and try it with better experienced patient person next time you find patients. That's all I have. Uh, thank you. We can proceed with the uh, questions. Yeah, doctor, we can move on to the Q&A section if you can access it. Okay. Okay, uh, Biniam asks, <clears throat> Best analgesic to use for management of rib fractures. Okay, so the management of pain for patients with rib fracture is almost identical to management of pain for other patients. What does that mean? You should follow the step, the, the, the WHO, the step ladder management. So you grade the severity of the pain. Uh, there are different grading tools. If the pain is, for example, in, uh, minimal pain, you can give patients paracetamol. Uh, and if the patient is kind of moderate, moderate severity, you can give a weak opioids like tramadol, like lofenac. And if the pain is very severe, you should go for stronger opioids like morphine. Or you and you should combine different kind of analgesics. For example, you can give paracetamol and uh, tramadol. The patient cannot get relief by just one analgesic. Uh, I hope that's clear. Who can perform pericardial synthesis for tamponade? Uh, <clears throat> so I think any physician can do. Uh, pericardial synthesis. But nowadays, I mean, you can educate yourself by watching uh, educational videos on YouTube, okay? And uh, performing pericardial synthesis should normally be done by either emergency physicians or uh, internists or surgeons with ultrasound guidance. So that is the most proper thing to do would be that one. But uh, in, in, when you come to the reality of our country, if you have, for example, a patient with tamponade in a, a district hospital, and if you don't have ultrasound, if you don't have those physicians, you should not wait until the patient dies. So any physician can do pericardiosynthesis. Just before you do it, try to have some reference, try to have some reading, and it's not really that much difficult to perform it. Okay. Uh, maybe I should start here, okay. 
in how many percent of patients we backstrad be positive? Okay, so backstrad will be positive usually in patients who come late after they develop pericardial tamponade. But you might find it in, in less than 50%. Usually 30 to 40% is what's written in books. Uh, but you might find one or two parts of the big stretch rather than all three of them. Okay. Uh, how can easily peak clinical and the potentially life threatening conditions like aortic and esophageal injury in low setup levels? Okay, uh, so uh, esophageal injury and diaphragmatic injury might be very difficult to diagnose. Even in the base setup, they might be difficult to diagnose. But uh, when you are following patients clinically, you might get some indications. For example, if you uh, Examine properly the, the mechanism of the injury. If it is a stab injury, posteriorly, just lateral to the midline, and patient on the second day or something becomes very febrile, or patient is developing odinophagia and the like, you can expect esophageal injury. Uh, or you do chest x ray, and uh, if you see the aortic, the, 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 the mediastinum is widened, you can expect aortic injury. So these are some of the tips that you can use to diagnose uh, these uh, potentially life threatening conditions. Solomon Tabebo asks, steps to be followed during chest tube removal. <laughs> okay, this, uh, you might have seen two different kind of recommendations. Some people say you tell the patient to inhale deeply and then remove it. Others say exhale deeply and remove it. I would suggest you to uh, ask the patient to inhale deeply and then remove it while the patient has inhaled. That means the lung is properly expanded. If there was some remaining air in the pleural cavity, it will be out. So after that, you patch it with uh, KOI jelly and uh, plaster. After chest tube insertion, most of the time, the whole hemothorax will not drain. We tend to remove the chest tube or manipulate, not functioning. What do you say on chest tube removal? Instead, for hemothorax, specifically based on chest x ray, is still showing some collection, but clinically doing fine. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, as much as possible, you should try to manipulate, you should try to position the chest tube uh, towards the, I mean, inferiorly so that the hemothorax is properly drained. Uh, we don't want to leave blood in the chest cavity because it can develop into what we call it caked hemothorax, meaning later the patient will require thoracotomy just to remove that so that the lung can expand properly. Uh, if with all these measures, with all this manipulation and the like, you cannot properly clear it. You can remove it as long as the patient is okay and you follow the patient with chest x-ray uh, and later the, the patient is not significantly improving you can refer the patient okay hannah or something asks what is the commonest area on x-ray to look for pneumothorax so pneumothorax is it is air collection, therefore, if the chest x-ray is taken while the patient is standing, you should expect the air to be uh, on the proximal and on the lateral side of the chest cavity. 
Solomon against Lang confusion without flare chest patient presentation and diagnosis and management. Pulmonary, this is pulmonary confusion management. This is basically what we have discussed earlier. The presence of flail chest or the absence of flail chest, it does not change the management of the pulmonary confusion itself. Uh, any classification of degree of hemothorax to decide on chest tube insertion? Okay, so if you find any hemothorax, insert chest tube. That is my recommendation. Recently, some people are challenging not to insert chest tube for, for a very small hemothorax, but let's let's not go into that discussion. We need to insert chest tube for any degree of hemothorax. Can you have tension hemothorax from closed chest trauma? Yes, we have discussed this earlier. While applying survey dressing, we better make the open side on the dependent side. Otherwise, the blood oozing will accumulate and disrupt our appliance. I agree with this. Mortality from single rib fracture. This is almost probably zero. This is a question from Jonas. <clears throat> Maybe if the rib fracture is the first rib, that might result in injury to the subclavia and vascular structures and the like. Otherwise, rib fractures are not really uh, deadly. Again, he asks how much is expected blood loss from single rib fracture. The rib fracture by itself does not bleed. There is association associated uh, intercostal vessels. There might be some bleeding. And the bleeding differs. I mean, you cannot just say 100 ml or 400 ml for everyone. It's different. Okay, another person asks, elaborate large bone needle thing and finger decompression more clearly. Uh, large bone needle uh, decompression meaning, so you use either 14 gauge, 16 gauge, 18 gauge needle, and you identify the second intercostal space. You go to the mid-clavicular line on the second intercostal space, and then you insert the needle. That's all. That's all you have to do. Uh, finger decompression is for patients who have a small penetrating trauma that has resulted in tension pneumothorax. So you wear sterile gloves, insert your finger, and it gives it more widening, so air will come out. Air will come out. Can open pneumothorax lead to tension? If it remains open, it will not develop into tension pneumothorax. But if that open pneumothorax gets, for example, kind of narrowed by cloth or some uh, traumatized tissue and the like, patient can eventually develop tension pneumothorax. Salim Ahmed asks, how do you see the new recommendation on using FIVS intercostal space for needle decompression? You don't have to go to the FIVS intercostal space for needle decompression of tension pneumothorax. I mean, the patient is most likely lying down. The patient is having air. Air always will be at the top. So the second is in the coastal space is better to decompress the air. And there is no difficulty in using the second in the coastal space. Uh, can we differentiate between open and tension pneumothorax using chest X-ray? No, 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 no. Tension pneumothorax, if you sir, if you send the patient is tension pneumothorax to the chest X-ray, that is not the right thing to do in the, in the future. Tension pneumothorax is a clinical diagnosis. But if you have chest X-ray, you will see mediastinal shift in uh, patients with tension pneumothorax. What is the recommended way of lifting the tongue from the pharynx? 
uh, you can do it with uh, if you have laryngoscope. If you don't have, you can use it oropharyngeal airways uh, and uh, can apply the oropharyngeal airway there so that it cannot fall back again. How to administer intracardiac adrenaline? The uh, intracardiac adrenaline administration will be a very dangerous recommendation to discuss on this session. Because uh, the dosing and the like might result in further damage and uh, it better be done in specialized centers. Best analgesic to use for the management of free. Okay, we have discussed this one. Do diaphragmatic injury should always be repaired? Uh, it's not always, sometimes small diaphragmatic injuries um, can, be, can be there. I mean, uh, especially on the right side because the liver is somehow protective. Uh, you some very small diaphragmatic injuries might be left, but the problem is you cannot properly see the size, it's difficult. Then progressively, it's difficult to predict which patients will develop uh, further lengthening of the diaphragmatic injury. Or, and uh, since diaphragm is a mobile kind of uh, uh, muscular tissue, with every breeze, even though the initial injury, the initial perforation is small, eventually it can become large. So if you identify it, it's better to manage it with surgery. And if uh, sometimes you might uh, uh, find all unidentified injuries later when patient undergoes another surgery or uh, intervention. Okay, I think uh, I have finished. If there are any further questions. Yeah, so Dr. Abraham, I would love to thank you on behalf of Blue LGT and all our participants. It was a very nice and informative as well as engaging session that we had today. We hope to see you in another session for the future. Dr. Abraham, thank you very much. And if you have anything you want to add at last, please do so. Okay, uh, thank you very much for inviting me as well. This is an important problem. Uh, and uh, I'm happy with the audience as well. Everybody was participating. Uh, if you have the attendees, if you have any consultations or referrals, you want to refer patients, you can uh, reach out to me. Uh, I hope we will meet with another session related to either general surgery or cardiothoracic surgery. I thank every everyone from the Blue Health team as well as the audience. Thank you.